Okay, let's all stand. Well, looking hindsight is always clear 2020 vision. So <clears throat> some 2000 years ago, after the fact, we may have some insights that the devil may have not even had. So let's go through this. Why did Jesus come? Everybody knows this, right? Why was Jesus, why did Jesus born? Why, why was he born as a man? Because he was bored? No, why? Blurt it out, somebody. To save us. He was born to save us. Well, how was it to save us? By suffering. By being persecuted. By being tortured and crucified on the cross. Now, because the Almighty God became a man with the physical body, he was now vulnerable to suffering and pain. He could feel pain now. Looking back at the Gethsemane, when Jesus prayed, we know that Jesus prayed that this cup be passed if possible. We know that Jesus, what dreaded most was not the physical suffering, but at the cross, Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's the most dreaded part of Jesus. He was in a perfect uni union in the Trinityhood. Three person and one for all eternity, forever and ever and ever. The only moment in all of eternity when the Son of God was separated from the Father was at the cross because there's too much sin on him. That's what Jesus feared the most, dreaded the most. He has never been apart from God, the Father. Never, ever. And he knew that moment was coming. Because Jesus became a man, because now he's going to take on all of sin. I mean, think about the sin in your life. We sin every day. Just us in this room, we would fill that sin bucket pretty full, pretty fast. But for all of mankind, for all of humanity, that was some serious sin. That Jesus Christ had to bear. And it separated for a moment. The union that Jesus Christ had. What the devil was offering with this temptation. Was for Jesus to achieve his goal. Immediately. Without suffering. Without pain. Without separation from the father. He said you worship me. Look at all this world. This is what you came here for right. Because he says in a, split, you know, in a moment of time. He showed, the, the devil showed Jesus everything in the world. This is what you came for? Here you go. I'll give it to you. Just worship me. No pain, no suffering, no separation. You could have it all. That was what the devil was, was tempting Jesus with. Devil showed him everything is, hey, I'm going to give you everything. What you came here for, here it is. Why wait? Go ahead and fulfill your purpose. Fulfill the reason why you came. <clears throat> now, there are a couple of issues with this proposition. First, just because God didn't immediately pronounce judgment on him for what he did at the Garden of Eden... That doesn't mean that God gave him all authority. It's not like God handed over the world and said, this is all yours. Now you're the king, you're the master. God didn't say that. Justice delayed is not justice denied. It just delayed. You know, this is why the devil is called a deceiver. He takes 90% of the truth 
and he adds 10% of his lies, which makes everything 100% deceit. This is exactly what he did when he tempted Eve, the first temptation ever. He is free to roam this world, but that doesn't mean he owns it. It is not his. He may think that he owns it because he has successfully tempted the humanity to sin and fall. With sin, he has caused separation between God and all of humanity, including us. He may look down on the world and see that it's full of sin and the miseries that result from sin and may think, hey, the world is mine. This is exactly how I wanted it. This is exactly how I got it to it. So I own it. He may feel that everyone is under his control because everyone is so vulnerable to sin. The devil may feel like the king of the world, but he's not the owner. Who's the owner? The creator, the almighty God. In other words, he is trying to give what is not his to give in the first place. That's the first thing that he did wrong. He's trying to give what is not his to give. And I see many of us do the same thing that the devil is doing also. Last Sunday, I was in a Horizon Ministries meeting with all of the Chondosani men pastor, youth pastors. There's about, I don't know, 20 of us. We were doing a small group discussion, and a couple of pastors shared how they were so discouraged by their youth is lack of spiritual maturing. So said, oh, I must be something wrong. My kids are not getting better. Actually, they're getting worse. I don't know if I should even be doing this. Couple were really, really discouraged. One even doubting his calling. Am I even called? Why isn't there any change around these people? I'm so worried and discouraged. I gently challenge them that they are trying to give what is not theirs to give. They do not have the ability to change hearts. None of us do. Our teachers, you don't have change, power to change your kids. I don't have power to change any of you in here. That they cannot even change their own hearts. I can't change my own heart. I need God to help me to change my own heart. I need God to change your hearts. Your hearts belong to God. That their job was simply to bring the water so that Jesus can turn it into wine in his time. We know from Abraham, Moses, things are not done immediately. It's done at God's time. God doesn't work off of our clock. We don't give time deadline to God. The outcome doesn't depend on my efforts, but God's intervention. We must do what we are called to do, which is to bring the water, bring our time, bring our efforts, bring our heart, bring our love. What we must do is to enjoy the process of bringing the water. Like I said last week, enjoy the time with God. Enjoy the time with others in God's presence. It is when we try to give what is not ours to give or try to accomplish an outcome in our time by our efforts that we fail and we fail miserably. Because it is no longer God's work that I'm doing, but it becomes my work. Hey, I'm trying to change her, her, him, her. How come they're not changing? My ego is hurt because they're not complying with what I'm trying to do. This is not our work. It's God's work. This part of the message was for the teachers and me. We need to enjoy 
our calling in the presence of God. There is no place for my ego or my sense of accomplishments, achievements. What we are called to do is enjoy our times and efforts with God and the youth. When we do that, we will never grow weary. You know, as a youth pastor and teachers, you know, some people say, oh, I serve for an year. I'm tired. I need a vacation. Well, nobody takes a vacation from God's work. Because it's supposed to be enjoyable. It's like, I need a vacation for my parents. Oh, they're such too much. Their love is sickening to me. <laughs> you know, that's what you're saying. <clears throat> and other times we give what seems to be ours to give. But we are treading in dangerous waters when we do this. We must be careful. What I'm saying is this. We give money to help those in need, whether a family member, a friend, or total stranger, and are proud of what we did with our money. Of course, we did what was right. We did what was good. But the moment I start being proud of what I did with my money, I make the same mistake that the devil is making here. Some may say things like, hey, I put in so many hours and hard work to get this money, or maybe to get that grade, or to get this career, or get to that college. But we work with the body and mind that God gave us. We use the things that God gave me. The reason why she can dance is because God gave her that body and that passion in her heart, right? The reason why Jimin could play that guitar and lead the praise is because God gave him. The reason why Rebecca could play and sing, same thing, all of us. We do what we do through the abilities. Let us not fool ourselves into thinking that we made ourselves because none of us did. Let us not fool ourselves into thinking that anything in our lives are truly mine you know as king solomon put it as he came from his mother's womb he shall go again naked as he came and shall take nothing for his toil for what he has what he may carry away in his hand basically we came with nothing everything we have here god gave us all of our education all of our career all of your grades your parents everything it doesn't take King Solomon's wisdom to know this. Job even said this. Naked I came from my mother's womb and naked shall I return. The Lord gave. The Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Not only the Old Testament. In the New Testament say the same thing. 1 Timothy 6, 7, 8 says this. For we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. Hebrews. But all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. The things that God gave you guys, your family, your talent, your intelligence, your abilities. God's going to ask, you, what did you do with them? Well, I took my money, I took my skills, and I did this for my ego. No. Everything is given to you by God, and God's going to be asking. I want to remind all of you, the body that you have was given to you by God. So keep it healthy, clean, pure, and holy. It's not yours. Your mind, your intelligence, your ability to think and to learn and to reason is given to you by God. Use it not to... Try to feed your ego by stomping on other people with your logic, with your reasoning, so that you could argue better, reason better, debate better. But use it for the glory of God. God gave it to you. Your heart, your capacity to love and desire is given you by God. So desire what is good, what is beautiful, what is godly. Your talents and your abilities are all from God. So do not use them to pursue worldly success 
worldly pleasures, but use it for God's service. Second, what the devil is offering do not actually achieve the end that Jesus came to do, the purpose that Jesus was born for. Why was Jesus Christ born? To atone for our sins. To atone for the sins of humanity so that our sins can be forgiven, so that we can reestablish our relationship with God, right? Dying was just the process. That's not the end. He didn't come to just die for the sake of dying. He died to forgive us. That was the purpose. But that it doesn't end there. So what we're forgiven? We have to get to reestablish relationship with God. Otherwise, God, Jesus Christ, died for nothing. That's what he came to do. That's the purpose. And Jesus cannot atone for our sins without dying for us. And dying is not a formality that Jesus is to just go through. His blood must be shed as a sacrificial lamb to atone for the sins of humanity. If the devil knew that, maybe he wouldn't have tried so hard to kill him in the first place. When the devil was trying to, what, what the devil was trying to sell Jesus is the idea that, hey, the end justifies the mean. You came here for the humanity? Well, I'll give it to you. You don't have to go through all of that stuff. Just worship me. But worshiping him, there is no forgiveness. There is no atonement. It may seem like there's that he's getting to the same result, but it is not. What Jesus is teaching us through this temptation is that the end does not justify the means. The means matter. No, actually, it is the mean that defines who you are as a Christian. Whatever we do, we cannot get to the right end that God has called us through, through the wrong methods, through the wrong means. The right end can only be reached through the right means. And what is right? Being right with God. God does not just give us tasks to finish and become successful to get the outcome. No. He gives us relationships to develop, whether it's your boyfriend, girlfriend, your husband or wife, your parents, your fellow youth. What's important is the relationship that we establish every day. Relationship with God, relationship with others. The outcome, the outcome is God's to achieve. What God is telling us is not to achieve that end, but achieve the means. The end is God's jurisdiction. Everything that we do, we do because we are doing it for God and with God, like I said last week, right? That's why Christian people like us, life is really about the journey. It is our journey with God. When we are with God, our destination must be right because we are with the right person. If you try to get to the right person by yourself without the right relationship with God or others, wherever you end up, it is not the right place. The phrase, and justifies the mean, is usually used in a setting where it is understood to mean doing something wrong to achieve what is right. Doing something wrong to achieve the right outcome. We see this throughout history. Okay, let's kill that village so we could save that village. Let's do some evil over here so we could defeat greater evil over there. People make excuses. It's all over our history. It's, we see it in our societies. At times, we may even see it at church. But let me just proclaim to you right now that as Christians, we could never, ever get to the right end through the wrong means or sinful methods. Whatever you do each day has to be right. As we close, I want all of us to make a commitment. Don't 
try to justify whatever you do that you know is wrong by thinking, hey, I could do something good with this. Hey, let me skip a Sunday at, at, at church, but I could do this other good. Hey, this QT, I'm going to skip that to do this. You know, this time with God and others, well, I don't have time for that. Let me do this other stuff. But then the end is good. God will probably like that end. We are not going to do that. I want to claim, proclaim that message to you. Right is always right. And wrong is always wrong. Sin is always sin. There's no getting around that. For the world, what really matters is the end, the result. Did you get an A? Well, I work so no, did you get an A? Well, I got a C plus, but I really did you get, you know? It's all about the result. Which college did you go to? Well, I studied really hard for which college did you go to? What's your career? How much money make you're making? This world don't care about second place. Don't care about good intentions. What did you achieve? This world is not interested in, in how you got there, as long as you get there. It doesn't matter if you're a nice, considerate person or total jerk, selfish bully. The question is, have you made it? Nobody wants excuses for failures. This is also true, not only in outcomes, but with worldly relationships. When I was doing great at my company in Korea, I told you already, I had all of these friends. Everybody wanted to, to be my friend. Everybody calls me, hey, you have time for dinner? Hey, you want to go out? But when my company was doing bad, nobody called me. When I called them, hey, I'm sorry, I'm busy. It's not that they were jerks or anything like that. It's not that they were bad people but they were just too busy with their life. They needed to get to an end and they only have 24 hours a day. And if you weren't useful, if you didn't benefit with, if you did not help them achieve their goal, then they just didn't have time for you. It's not that they didn't like you or they were just jerks, but that's how the world operates. For Christians, it is the means that define what we hold dear to our heart, what we value, who we are, and who we love. For Christians, the question that we ask should not be consequential, but relational. Who do we spend time with? Spend our money, time, energy, efforts for? The question is not how much we achieved today, but how much we loved today. Don't let today depart from you without loving somebody in godly way. For Christians, our means are comp comprised of spending time with God and others in love. Our eternity, the end, it's just a continuation of these means, these every days make up our end. Understand? So, don't be so entrenched in the result that it just ruins your life. You're just so focused on getting there, getting there, getting there. Soon you will lose your ways. And you will not get there. Think of today. You know, relational basis. Am I loving today? Am I spending time with God? The method is right. The destination, the result has to be right. Let's close our eyes. Our Heavenly Father, the world is just pressing us, pressing us. Sometimes our parents are pressing us, pressing us for results. I know they mean well, Lord. But you tell us, it is not tomorrow that counts for me, it's today. Are you happy? Are you loving? Are you working hard for relationship with me and others? 
Of course, you have to do what you have to do. Anything worth doing is worth doing well. So if you're going to do it, do it well. Not because of some results, because that's what I have called you to do. I pray that you would be with our kids, our teachers, our parents, and me, Lord. Not that we don't care about where we end up, but we'd be so focused and lost at that end result that we forget about today, what matters today. Help us not to do wrong to achieve anything that's right. Wrong is wrong. Sin is sin. Help us not to package it and fool ourselves and deceive ourselves like the way the devil wants us to, to deceive ourselves, Lord. Pray that your Holy Spirit would just guide us. Give us wisdom. Not to get good grades, but to recognize deceit and sin and temptation at our hearts, in our minds, and overcome it, Lord. We thank you and we pray all these things. In the name of Lord Jesus Christ, amen. God is good, amen. amen. So just before we end worship today, um, we just want, we know that God has given us so many great things um, and perhaps one of the most um, important thing was our identity. Um, and just how we are a child of God. So uh, let's just sing that out today. Um, and yeah, just recognize just how great God is. I was lost, but he brought me all his love for me, all his love for me. To the sun sets free, oh, it's free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. Father.